And uh, I am wearing a full body suit, jumpsuit. I know you're a little bit jealous right now already. Uh, there's a good reason I'm wearing this and I'm going to tell you at some point. But uh, I'd like to start somewhere else. I'd like to start where you are, this picture behind me, which is my graduation show from the National Film School of Denmark in 2012. We had built this giant studio with a forest in it, and we had invited a lot of children to sit in this forest. And then we told them to watch an animated film like Frozen or any other film they watch in the cinema. But there was one difference. With our film, the characters in the film actually saw the children and could interact. So whatever the children did, the characters could actually see that because we had actors standing in another room controlling them and seeing them and listening to them. So every show was unique and adapted to the children audience at that specific day. So it went well, everyone were happy. Um, but at one point during the show, something happened that we didn't plan with because this little boy, he suddenly just stood up and then he started walking towards the screen and then he just tried to enter that <laughs> imaginary world. And uh, so we wanted them to interact, of course, but we did not really expect them to sort of jump <laughs> into this animated world. So we thought, wow, okay, what to do? The actors somehow guided him back to his seat uh, and finished the show. But this experience really stuck with me. This was, a, this was all I remembered after that show. So after the show, I tried to find out, so who, who was this boy who completely forgot everything around him? I mean, he obviously didn't really care that people were watching. He wasn't afraid. So I found that he is autistic. He is suffering from autism. He can't normally relate or open up to any other humans. So he's afraid of eye contact and the human smile that changes every time. Somehow when confronted with this animated world that we created, he felt safe and he actually felt that he could interact. He wanted to interact. He did something his family had never seen him do before, which was take initiative to a conversation, just walk up there. So that was completely mind blowing for me and for the whole team. We were film guys and we just wanted to make a fun experience. And now we thought if we could put a therapist inside an animated character, we might be able to make these children speak about things that they wouldn't normally speak about and open up to sides that they wouldn't tell another human being. So, I mean, how powerful was that? That was just a completely new direction. We were already sort of amazed that of all the possibilities that this concept opened up about, but this, we had to go for this. One challenge though, one big, literally big challenge, which is this. So this is a motion capture studio. This is what you use to record the movements of humans and put onto animated characters. So we had our actors standing in a room like this behind the scenes. So a lot of cameras filming these markers you have on your body. When three cameras can see a marker, it can place it in the room. But you need tons of space. You need millions of dollars worth of equipment. You have to have an army of tech people that know stuff that I don't know anything about to set it up. And you can only be within reach of these cameras. So we had to invent our own. Um, and I sat there with the team after the show and said, what, I mean, what can we do? We were this one engineer, one philosopher, one film guy. And then our friend Anas, who was working on modeling the characters, he's sort of a self-taught engineer. He had this idea. He said, I mean, we might be able to take sensors like you have in your cell phone and then just replace all these markers with sensors. And then I think you might be able to put that entire studio on your body in a suit. Um, uh, that sounds good. Uh, do we know? Do we know how? Uh, he, he had some ideas. <laughs> Let's, and so long story short, a couple of years later, we kind of did it. So now I can finally tell you why I'm wearing this funny suit. I am wearing on my body everything you see in that picture behind me. And if we're really lucky, I might actually be able to show you how it works. So I just have to, yeah, I put my head on. So I have to straighten myself out for a couple of seconds and then I should be able to 
do motion capture. So right now, <laughs> I am controlling this guy. And there are no cameras, no nothing, only sensors on my body. Yeah. And um, if I wanted to be a frog, I could do like this. And I'm a frog. Hey. And if I wanted to be in a forest, I could do like this. <laughs> so basically, everything we wanted to do was solved in an instant. If you know how to put on your clothes, you'll know how to set the system up. So most of us should be OK. Um, so what we did was invent something that was intuitive to everybody, it's affordable to everybody, and you can use it anywhere. So with this invention, we thought, well, we could actually maybe, can you concentrate? <laughs> what if I do, I can do like this. <laughs> All right, let's maybe go to the other screen again. <laughs> now, so basically, we had reinvented this technology. All we did was make it intuitive and easy to use, and then tons of ideas came out of it. So we thought, well, I mean, we should give this to everybody. So we started making these suits and selling them to a lot of people all over the world. And in this process, I sort of started thinking, well, I mean, which is my general question today that I want to share with you. We are interacting with the digital world all the time. It's becoming such a natural part of our lives. Why are we still interacting with it in such an unnatural way? We have, so I understand that generations before us, like this nice lady, she doesn't really stand a chance. I mean, she, so she has had to relearn this again and again and again and at some point. I mean, fair enough. I, I don't, I don't know. So, but my generation, I mean, we came, I mean, I was brought up with this. I know what this is. It, it's not intuitive. I mean, is this, like sitting in front of a computer like this, is that intuitive? Or clicking a mouse like this? Or even standing with joysticks like this? I mean, it's, it's, it's not really logical if you think of it. And companies like Apple, for instance, we, they invented Siri, so voice recognition. You can speak to your computer. That is nice. And that is actually something that she would understand. So come into a room. You just speak to the computer like you're speaking to all your friends. That's intuitive. But what about the body? I mean, how do you interact with it? So the pioneers of virtual reality reinvented the screen. They're, I mean, if you, you put snowboard goggles on your head, and then you can look in any direction you want, completely intuitively. You choose what you focus on and when. That's nice. They didn't reinvent mouse and keyboard. So you're still, I mean, you can look anywhere, but you're still sitting like this. I mean, you need that last point. You need to be able to stand up and actually take part. And I think for many of us, it's not really, uh, I mean, for instance, the Nintendo Wii. I don't know if you remember that. So these, you had these white control. I bought one, so don't worry. Uh, it's, you, you bought those controllers, and then you were told you can play tennis or golf in your living room. And then you just really like went for it and like like top spin and backhand slice and and then you found out, I mean, if you stand like this, this basically is maybe better. And if you <laughs> if you sit down like this, I mean, no wonder we're lazy. It's yeah. So that didn't make any sense. And the thing is, if you have only two inputs, only things in your hand. What about the rest of it? I mean, then we would all look the same. Everyone in this room would look the same. We would all look completely alike, which is not, I mean, it's not good enough. I mean, my, so I, I'm wearing this suit a lot, and I jump around as a frog pretty much every day um, in meetings. <laughs> and sometimes, so my wife uh, was here today, sees me in the suit, but she also sometimes sees me as a frog without me in the room. And she can recognize me instantly. I mean, she could pick me out of a line of a thousand frogs in a second. She could just say, that's him. Because she knows exactly how I'm standing. And of course, I mean, you can't hide how you move in the real world. I mean, why would you, you, you need that level of accuracy. But so, so what is it that's missing 
it's, I think in the digital interaction, it's pretty basic things. It's like empathy. How are you going to get empathy if you don't really see, if, if you don't know if people are really there? I mean, and what do you do about so presence is a term that I study a lot. I'm really fascinated with this. How do you get presence in a room where you're not actually there? So I read this study about presence, which is, so how in virtual reality, how do you feel present in a virtual room? And what they found out was you could stand in the most photorealistic, perfect room that looks exactly like nature and still feel just an observer. I mean, you're just watching, you're not present. But as soon as you have to do something there, as soon as you have to grab something, then you feel present. And as soon as you have to interact with someone, and if they even look a little bit like a human, if you know there's someone in there right now, then you feel present. You could be standing in an infinite white room. I mean, nothing like anything on Earth, but as long as you have that kind of interaction, then you feel present. And of course, I mean, you can't, when you're outside, you want you want to feel, I mean, it's comfortable knowing how people move. And so we're cheating so much in the way we interact in the digital world. I have, so this other day I was sending a text message to one of my friends. So he wrote me, um, probably something very stupid. And then I responded with this emotic, like emoji that was crying with joy. I mean, like crying, I mean, laughing so hard that he was crying. And as I was sending it, I wasn't even laughing. <laughs> I was just sending it. So, I mean, I was crying with joy. If he was sitting opposite me, he could probably see that I wasn't even laughing. So, I mean, is that lying? Is that okay? It's at least, it's another kind of interaction. And I think the kind of interaction I'm thinking about is not possible yet. And I'm thinking, so, so what would it take? So, in my company, so we started out making these films at film school. Then we had this autism treatment project that's still running. Then we made the suit. And now we're actually making this AI engine. So sounds pretty scary, but it isn't. So artificial intelligence, we're collecting all the data that people are generating when they're in the suit. And based on that, we're building this body recognition engine. So all of you could access this engine in time, like the voice recognition. And then we would get this level of accuracy that's a little bit higher than what we have now. So you could actually, everyone would look unique. My wife would recognize me. So it's funny, I visited my parents this weekend and they, when I got into film school, they were really proud. And when I started treating children with autism, oh my God, it's very nice. <laughs> then when I started, I mean, then I turned this company more and more into a tech company. Now I live in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley. Tech company, I mean, it's not that they're not proud, but they're not really telling their friends anymore. <laughs> I think they're still saying, he's doing f the film thing. Um, and it's funny how, I think it's an entire generation that thinks that tech is something that's driving us apart. That's encouraging this anti-social behavior. And I think, so I, I see what they mean. I see how tech has played a part in some inequalities and cyber warfare is pretty scary. And, but I mean, it's coming no matter what, and we are controlling it. I mean, we should be the ones deciding what will happen when any of us. And as a non-tech person who is now CEO of a tech company, I can see things from both sides. I mean, I can see, I work with these brilliant engineers every day that can make magic, that can make everything. And I see that what they want and what I want is find these synergies. I mean, find these ethics that we can build into the technology so it doesn't get out of hand. And it doesn't make sense to be afraid of it, to distance yourself from it. I mean, because it's not going anywhere, it's, it's, it's coming. And I understand having like a machine operate in your brain is kind of scary, but if that machine is better than any human that ever lived, maybe it's nice. Um, and we can influence it. I mean, the fact that we were naive at film school might be why we actually got this idea, might be why we succeeded, because we didn't know the boundaries. So I have really 
great conversations with these engineers every day. We're trying to shape this the right direction. And I have this, so Matthias, who's the frog maestro, uh, we started the company together years ago. And I had this experience where he, he told me that every time you start a sentence, Jakob, you say, I feel, or I'm feeling that. So when you talk to like tech people or business people, I mean, say I know or I mean, it's better, more believable. <laughs> and I sort of I agree. Uh, I stopped doing it for a little while. But I think it's actually really important to talk about feelings in tech. And I think it's really important that we work on getting these ethics and these values into technology. And I think everyone here could actually work on that in their own way. Really wanting to understand, like really insisting that I have to understand this, it shouldn't scare me because we're all part of it. So one thing that I want to leave with you now is I am working on getting some more feelings into tech. Um, and I hope that you will join me. Thank you.